if you're going golfing, uh, it's a little bit like digital marketing where, you know, you have a bunch of clubs in your bag if you're going to be successful. Uh, maybe Facebook's your driver and Google's your putter and they're the two most important clubs and you're going to use them the most. But if they're the only two you have, you're not going to shoot a very good round of golf, no matter how good you get at those two specific things. What's going on, Founder Fam? Nathan Chan here, CEO and publisher of Founder Magazine. Welcome back to another Founder interview. And guys, if you are enjoying these interviews, please make sure that you give us a thumbs up for this particular interview. Make sure you leave a comment below. We write back to every single question that you have about this topic, about this interview. And then also make sure you subscribe. We interview some of the greatest entrepreneurs of our generation. We produce so much awesome content for you that we don't want you to miss out. All right, so today we're speaking with Colin Doretta, and he is the co-founder of a few different companies, one called Wellpath, which is a health and wellness brand, and then another called Dojo Mojo, which is a software company which helps you build uh, partnerships. So guys, I think you're gonna learn so much from Colin because he's built a one million person email list in one year. He's a master of monetizing email lists and also building them. So Colin, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah, so the first question that I ask uh, everyone that comes on is, uh, how did you get your job? Yeah, um, a circuitous path is the short answer. The long answer is, I came out of the the finance world, started doing investment banking at Goldman Sachs, then went to one of the big New York hedge funds, um, learned a ton, but also found that ultimately to be like somewhat soul crushing work, as I think a lot of ex-finance people are prone to say. Um, But I got super into health and wellness during that period. I think it was a counterbalance to how fundamentally unhealthy everything else about my lifestyle had to be. Um, you know, working those hundred hour work weeks, which everyone hears about. Uh, and that became my hobby and my passion. And it was one of these classic cases where something that I became interested in as a side hustle ultimately became, uh, you know, the platform for my main thing, which initially was Wellpath. Um, so I left the hedge fund world and decided that there was a lot of things that the, you know, health and nutrition CPG industry wasn't satisfying for someone like me. And I've always operated under the operative belief that I'm not a special little snowflake and that my problems are probably problems shared by other people. That's the fundamental precept of effectively every business that I've had my hand in founding has always been that if you solve your own problem, and this is not a novel um, statement, if you're solving your own problem, you're probably solving a problem for a lot of other people, unless it's a really, really niche edge case sort of problem. And that's what we did with Wellpath, and and quite frankly, that's what we did uh, again with Dojo Mojo, and and most recently with Finn, the third business. Got you. I see. So, um, can you tell me, like, when did you launch Wellpath? Yeah. So we launched Wellpath in 2015, um, and you know, uh, not that you asked, but it was first couple years as an entrepreneur were fraught with challenge. Um, like we did far more wrong than we did right. Uh, it was, you know, there's the, the old Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams, where there's a voice, and I'm going to butcher the exact verbiage, but there's a voice in the, the ether telling him, if, if you build it, they will come, right? Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, felt that if I go out there and I build this product and it's novel and it's innovative and it's a better product than anything on the market, customers will just ultimately show up at my doorstep. Uh, and so I under-indexed how important marketing was going to be. And this is, you know, 2015 before kind of entrepreneurship had gotten quite as big and as before there was as much literature on entrepreneurship as there is today and, and before there were podcasts like this one. Uh, and that kind of led us down a, a really challenging period for, for a couple of years that ultimately then led us to um, the idea that became Dojo Mojo and how we develop large email audiences as a primary mechanism for uh, early stage customer acquisition for businesses. When you say we, did you have a co-founder for Wellpath? Yep, sure did. Uh, so I had a co-founder for Wellpath who's 
uh, the same individual that I co-founded Dojo Mojo with. Um, we brought on a third partner in 2018 who uh, has now worked with us on WellPath and, and Finn, which is the recently launched brand and is working with us on all of the subsequent brands as well as um, you know, has been party to our fundraising efforts and everything that we've done in the past couple of years. Got you. So when you said when you launched WellPath, it was fraught with challenges. Um, how did you come up with the idea and and what exactly, yeah, happened? So, I mean, we couldn't figure out how to get to an audience. And um, within the nutrition and wellness space, eyeballs on channels like Facebook and Google were really expensive and, and continue to be expensive. Um, so while those two channels will always be important tools in your toolkit when it comes to customer acquisition, if they're the only two, you've got a bit of a problem, right? Because you might hit a certain amount of um, you know, relatively inexpensive acquisition on those two platforms, but at some point that well will dry up. Uh, what we were really fortunate is both my business partner and I um, have remained active angel investors in and around the New York ecosystem, whether it's consumer tech or also CPG. Uh, and what we saw was other businesses doing partnerships of various forms, uh, but some as simple as things like sweepstakes where, you know, the skim might work with Equinox and Shape Magazine, for instance. And the three of those brands would promote a giveaway to all their audiences and in a, you know, legally compliant way, compliant with privacy law, which obviously is is changing day to day, but still this, this tactic is entirely combined, they would be able to effectively barter the one another's audience attention, as well as anyone who entered in the ultimate giveaway, they, could, they would share in those emails. And as opposed to the traditional way of acquiring first party data, whether it's an email or phone number, which is either at the point of sale or on a light box on your website, doing these partnerships would enable you to acquire instead of, you know, a couple hundred emails away a, a day, excuse me, you'd be acquiring thousands upon thousands of emails through these partnerships, sometimes 25,000, 50,000 in one fell swoop. The, the problem that we were watching these brands encounter was there was no infrastructure to actually support these partnerships being executed. So if you wanted to go work with someone at the skim, for instance, you had to go find, get a warm introduction or reach out to that person on LinkedIn. And as we all know, we're all inundated with LinkedIn messages, so we're more likely than not to just ignore that message. So if you didn't have a warm intro, that part was very hard. And then on top of it, as many early stage entrepreneurs can probably empathize, if you basically were able to get all these partners uh, corralled, you still needed to then go have someone and devote resources to building the back end infrastructure to actually, you know, run a giveaway or whatever else, what sort of partnership you might be doing. And that's having precious engineering resources as well as your own precious bandwidth as an entrepreneur being directed at something that's probably not core to your product. Um, and so we saw that there was a hole in the market for an actual tech solution that would have a network of brands. Dojo Mojo now is about 10,000 brands on it. Anyway, anyone from the likes of the brands that I just mentioned, on down to you know all the Hearst properties and the Condé Nast properties, um, all the way to you know very early stage startups. So there's kind of uh, a menu of brands contingent on the size of your own company. So we built a network for those brands as well as we built the infrastructure. So if you want to run these sorts of partnerships, you could use what effectively became a WYSIWYG. So you wouldn't have to hire you know hire contractors or use your own engineering resources to accomplish it. With WellPath, you built a million person email list in a year effectively from brokering these partnerships. Yeah, the, the, the partnerships alongside other mechanisms um, to kind of supercharge our email list. And the thing I would say is it, it wasn't any one tool like it wasn't just doing giveaways with a bunch of partners right you need to use everything in concert so we do these giveaways we'd also have 
uh, the light box set up on our landing page. We'd also do content swaps, for instance, with specific media partners. So WellPath's a nutrition and wellness site. So we would do content swaps with, at the time, we were doing it with brands like Well and Good and Mind Body Green and any other publishers. And ultimately, Dojo Mojo was built to do all of those things, right? So it was the somewhat classic case of we were building the solution for WellPath's own problems. So I was sitting there as an entrepreneur trying to build an e-commerce business and knowing that if I could acquire a lot of emails that I could ultimately sell my, try to sell my product to anyway, uh, that would help me scale my e-com business. And then we had the software business on the side where we said, well, why don't we build the exact tools we need to go succeed with our e-com business? And, uh, you know, thanks to that, we were able to um, profitably scale WellPath into the eight figures and beyond. And we did it without ever raising uh, more than basically a million bucks of capital. So super capital efficiently. Um, and I think that's the one thing that partnerships and email as a channel still enables that channels like Facebook and you know, AdWords might not, right, is you can be really capital efficient about it because you can do, go do email acquisition uh, effectively for the cost of your labor as opposed to if you want to scale using Facebook and Google, you know, it takes hard dollars. So we were entrepreneurs who we hadn't raised enough capital. We needed to find a more cost effective way. It, you know, the lack of capital gave us a lack of options. So it forced a certain amount of discipline on us and email and then direct response marketing were the key bulwarks for us to ultimately go build the WellPath business. And now we're doing it over again um, with our third business. Got you. So um, I'm curious, like once you would, you know, build this email list, what would, what would that, um, you know, experience look like to uh, encourage someone to buy a product? Because from my experience, when you get people to join an email list from a, you know, a giveaway or some sort of um, freebie or swap, sometimes um, they just want the freebie or they just want the giveaway and it's not the best kind of quality potential prospect. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, and that's where a lot of people tend to go wrong with it, uh, is they treat an email acquired through what I call a higher funnel activity, the same way as they treat an email that they might acquire on a light box on their website. And those two people are fundamentally different individuals, right? And so far as someone who came to your website, informed themselves about your product and gave you their email, is someone who's clearly interested and relatively well-educated about your product. Uh, and therefore, the way you email them, and so far as the drip campaign that you're going to feed them, should look very different from someone who might have only the barest level of familiarity with your brand. So our, our approach with anyone that we consider a higher um, funnel email acquisition is to lead actually with content before we follow up with commerce. Um, we have a full-time editorial staff and have a content site at thepathmag.com, which produces original content, the vast majority of which never even mentions anything about our products. We'll have banner ads for WellPath on there and occasionally we'll mention our products. Uh, but for the most part, we uh, believe that you need to educate, engage, and empower your readership. And that's how you actually activate those emails. So the sell for us comes down after the third or fourth email. The first several are just oriented to how do we get this person engaged about this newsletter? How do we get them excited to read the content that we're putting out there? And where brand after brand after brand goes wrong, is they acquire an email that's not particularly well qualified and they don't go to the trouble of qualifying it because they just wanna to try to get that quick sale. And unsurprisingly, a huge amount of those emails are gonna churn out of their ESP very quickly or they're just never gonna engage and uh, you're gonna to have to remove them yourself, otherwise they'll damage your IP rating. Um, so I think that people investing in a drip campaign that really over indexes on telling a story and finding a narrative for your brand and why this person should care is super important before you ever try to make the sale.
when it comes to like, I guess, opens and stuff like that, like how long would you run a drip campaign for and, and stuff like that for those kind of people? Sure. We'll run our, our drip campaigns are typically five email campaigns on a three day separation cadence. Um, we've tried a lot of different things. We've found that that tends to work best. Um, we're really disciplined that if someone doesn't open any of our emails after basically three months, we jettison them from our list. And then uh, down the road, we can try to do re-engagement campaigns. Uh, a lot of people have this wrong-headed idea, wrong idea of a big email list is a good thing. Like the number is all that matters. And the reality of that uh, obviously is, you know, an unengaged email is actually not only is it useless, it's actively harming you by sitting in your email list. Um, so, you know, we, even on the emails that we've basically acquired through giveaways, we still have open rates of over 20%. And that's because when someone isn't engaging with us, we don't want them in our email list. Similarly, we make it really easy for people to unsubscribe. Uh, again, there's nothing more frustrating for a consumer because we've all been in this position of not being able to actually unsubscribe effectively. And it does significant harm to your deliverability. Uh, deliverability is you know, the name of the game when it comes to email, particularly when you're acquiring a lot of less qualified emails. Because if you've get, done good practices in the past, then those new less qualified emails you get, you'll still get into their inbox. And that gives you a bite at the apple. And then it's up to them to engage with your email list or not. And if they don't, you want to get them right out of there. So at any given time, we've probably acquired uh, now with WellPath specifically about two and a half million emails um, to date. We're probably only emailing about 650 or 700,000 people every month because there's a bunch of people that have just churned out and that's okay. Like I really want to emphasize that no one should fight tooth and nail to keep someone in their list if it doesn't want to be there. When it comes to, I guess, asking for the sale and trying to, you know, turn that prospect into a customer, how long have you seen it usually takes from a, a giveaway versus, yeah, a light box scenario? Sure, the, the light box, um, particularly if you use, and this is a whole different subject, but light box for SMS, we found to be really, really effective at converting people. Um, you know, that you, you lead with the sale, right? Because someone's already, um, for lack of a better term, on the hook. So our first SMS message will be, um, you know, some tiny discount to try to get that, you know, whether it's 10% or something to that, effect, to that effect, to try to get the sale closed right then and there. Um, whereas with email, you know, it's going to be after we've received someone's email, they're not even going to get any sort of message that indicates how they could purchase our product, probably for, you know, uh, almost 10 days. Right. Um, and after that, our golden ratio of content to commerce is two to one. So we're always putting out at least twice as much content as we are. Uh, sending emails that are trying to get them to transact on something. And so for us, where we've got a uh, broad enough amount of SKUs, you know, we've got about 10 different SKUs um, that cover a wide gamut of, you know, wellness and nutrition needs, there's a very good chance that someone isn't going to be exposed to the product that actually might resonate with them for a month, right? Um, so what we're more oriented towards is less you know, the speed of time between that email acquisition and converting them as it is to just get them really engaged with our email flow and have them opening all of our content emails every time they come, because that'll get us bite at the apple after bite at the apple after bite at the apple. We've found that there have been people who've been reading our content for six months before they've ever made a purchase. Um, and then there's some people who, you know, get the first piece of content, find their way to our product and ultimately purchase there. Um, and it really does have a wide range. The great thing about email is having that person's email address in your list costs you very little provided they're engaged. So you know, we don't need to rush them to it. We'd rather engender a lot of you know, trust and, and loyalty to the brand uh, and focus on creating good customers as opposed to just creating quick customers. Yeah, I love that. And that makes sense. So when it comes to, I guess, the content piece, um, and you said that you have like a whole editorial team. Um, how do you make sure 
that like, so like, let's just say you did a partnership with the skim, you did a giveaway. How do you make sure that you find and identify the right people? Because not everybody off that, that from the skim would be interested in health and wellness because it is, yeah, it's more niche than the skim is quite broad. How, how do you work that out? Yeah, so I think um, the type of partnerships you're doing, for instance, the type of giveaways and what have you, is going to have a big indication on who's going to enter, right? If you're doing a wellness giveaway that's a, it's a trip to uh, Costa Rica for a seven-day yoga retreat, that is going to self-select a certain type of person. Um, what we've found is the first and most important thing that you can do is select the right partners, right? So when we've worked with Equinox, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but you know, a gym with a, a affluent health and wellness crowd converts really, really well for us, right? Um, the skim actually also converts really, really well for us when we've partnered them with them. Um, but we tend to orient ourselves towards finding partners that make intuitive sense. I mean, who, people who are in the health and wellness uh, sphere. So that's by far the most deci important decision you can make. And a lot of people go wrong there um, because a lot of people, uh, brands orient themselves again towards, I wanna work with bigger partners rather than I wanna work with better partners. Uh, and so I would tell you that any day of the week, if you select the right partners, even though you might acquire far fewer emails, they're ultimately gonna convert at a, you know many times order a magnitude rate. The discrepancy can be as great as um, you know, I'll give some metrics. We'll, we'll convert about 1.5% of every email we acquire when we partner with the skim. Um, we've partnered, I, I won't mention whom, but we've partnered with some brands that are, you know, have a pretty good reputation, aren't targeted in health and wellness, but we thought they were going to have an engaged audience and we converted less than 0.1% of the emails we acquired. So the Delta can be super wide. Uh, there's, it, it's hard to ever get it perfectly right. There's a certain degree of trial and error that you work with various brands and sometimes they'll surprise you to the downside, sometimes they'll surprise you to the upside. What we've found is your intuition though generally will direct you correctly when you're, you know, when you kind of as an entrepreneur create your 10 to 20, you know, perfect brands that you'd love to partner with um, within the realm of being realistic, right? Like every health and wellness brand probably says Nike. That's not even, that's not necessarily achievable for if you're a small brand, but provided you're being realistic, uh, you'll tend to be right on nine out of 10 of those. And where things go really wrong from an engagement perspective is when you start to go really far afield of, you know, what your brand is and, and you're kind of making these rationalizations as to, well, you know, maybe these guys work as a partner. I get that they have nothing to do with my brand, but like, I think their target demographic is similar. And that's when things start to go a bit sideways. When it comes to building Wellpath, did you, you said like you didn't have um, as much capital uh, to, to go to like, you know, um, Facebook ads, you know, PPC, but at the same time, like you could have, you could have spent that million dollars that you raised on that and, and made it work, true? I think we spent, candidly, I think we spent unwisely enough early on um, where by the time we got to the point and said, all right, like maybe we should make a harder run at other marketing channels, like for instance, Facebook, um, we just didn't have enough cash left in the bank, like really transparently. So it forced us to get scrappy because you, know, you can't go do the sort of learnings you need to do once you've got, you're down to your last, you know, 150K, 200K, because, you know, I, what most agencies would have told us, because um, we're now doing much more significant uh, spending in the way of Facebook and Google um, on our other brands, given, you know, where we're at. Uh, it, most people say, hey, if you can't spend 25 or 30K a month and expect for your first three months or so to, just not be that cost effective from a ROAS perspective, you know, you're going to have a really hard time succeeding on any of the major, um, well, on Facebook or, or on Google. Um, and, you know, even then I look at a lot of comps out there and people are finding ways to do it profitably, but certainly not an LTV to CAC of three, you know, three plus times, um, which, 
you know, people more time, more often orient that as a, a kind of SaaS metric to be focused on, but I think it's true in CPG as well of you should try to be orienting yourself to ultimately getting, you know, better than three to one um, CAC for any given channel, uh, LTV to CAC for any given channel. And it's okay if you have a couple of channels that are helping drive the other ones that you're not able to achieve that on. But if your only channel is going to be Facebook and then you're hoping that's going to drive enough organic noise that you can average um, your customer acquisition costs down far enough such that your ratios work, like that's a tough game and it's getting, it's only getting tougher, right? I think people who don't think about um, other channels are really risking limiting themselves. The, the metaphor that I use that's a, a little bit hokey because I'm not even a golfer, but I think of like uh, most people are familiar with the game of golf. And if you're going golfing, uh, it's a little bit like digital marketing where, you know, you have a bunch of clubs in your bag if you're going to be successful. Uh, maybe Facebook's your driver and Google's your putter and they're the two most important clubs and you're going to use them the most. But if they're the only two you have, you're not going to shoot a very good round of golf, no matter how good you get at those two specific things. And that's the thesis that we've really embraced. Um, you know, email and partnerships and direct response marketing have become an enormously important club in our bag. We've also overinvested in making sure that we have other clubs in our bag. And we think that that's a, part, a big part of actually why we're ultimately being more successful on channels like Facebook and Google, because um, you know, the truism that consumers will react more positively when they're seeing your brand in place after place after place, and that will ultimately get the conversion. And while it makes attribution a nightmare sometimes because they could be exposed in a bunch of different places, at the end of the day, the thing that we ultimately care most about is are we acquiring customers in a cost-effective way that enables us to continue scaling our businesses? Yeah, no, I think you make a good point there. Um, and I appreciate your honesty, um, but yeah, omni-channel, like, yeah, look, you have to work towards mastering them all. Um, it just depends on which that you can start with. If it's early days, bootstrapping, or raising VC, you've got a, you've got a limited amount of funds that you're trying to multiply. Whatever, whatever situation you're in, and you need to just focus on one channel, get it working, then move to the next one once that, that those wheels are turning. So um, it sounds like for you guys, the big unlock was the partnerships and the email swaps and the giveaways. And then, yeah, okay. Um, so then when did you launch Dojo Mojo? So Dojo Mojo launched, I guess, end of, you know, it was in a bit of a beta, but call it end of 2016. And you know, one thing that, uh, was great about building a partnership marketing software was we never did any paid advertising for it. So it got to over 10,000 brands simply by virtue of word of mouth because what we found, most of the partnerships on Dojo are uh, multi-brand partnerships, which is to say that you know there'll be four or five or six brands all partnering on a single partnership. And what, the, what we found is when someone would have a successful partnership, they'd say, well, boy, I wanna go do another one. I have this brand in mind, I might know someone at it, I'm gonna invite them onto the platform. And so all of Dojo Mojo's growth, the whole network and community that's developed around Dojo um, was effectively people who showed up organically and signed up of their own volition. It is a common thing that like, you know, you're not in the SaaS world, but you need to build internal tooling to help your, your core business grow. And so you build that internal tooling and then you're just like, okay, um, maybe there's something here because people ask about if they can use it or whatever. Um, you didn't wait that long to, to move into that though because you started Wellpath, I think you said 2015. Oh, dude, 100% right. We kind of banged our heads against the wall with Wellpath for you know a bit over a year before we said, man, what are we not getting? And is there any other way we could grow? Um, and you know, really fortunately, like I said, we saw other people using the partnership strategy, but they didn't have internal tooling or any tooling to help facilitate it. And it made it super laborious to execute the strategy. When I first tried to execute the strategy, I wasn't even thinking about us going and building a tech solution for it. 
I said, oh, I'll just go do this and I'll go on LinkedIn and uh, send hundreds, if not thousands of messages and get uh, you know 5% hit rate on those messages and then have my engineering team instead of being building the back end infrastructure for our you know uh, personalized wellness products they were building me landing pages for giveaways right and at some point i said well this is a little bit silly why isn't there any infrastructure why hasn't anyone ever built that uh and and you know that was the the catalyzing moment for us to say well let's go just build a solution for ourselves i think pretty early on though this wasn't one of those cases where we said let's build our internal tooling and we never have any plans of letting anyone else use it I think pretty early on, we saw a lot of people were using the strategy. We saw that people were using it with this um, piecemeal, you know, lack of real tech solution to do it. And we said, boy, if this is actually a real strategy that works for brands and we can actually build a tool that makes it a lot easier, that could be a real business in and of itself. And, and what ended up happening is, is my business partner, Alex, um, split off to go effectively run Dojo Mojo on a day-to-day -day basis where you know, I'm, I'm his co-founder and sit in our leadership meetings. And I went to run WellPath on a day-to-day -day basis. We're both in the same office. Uh, Dojo Mojo and WellPath share office space. So you can think of, you know, we've got 50 people under one roof, but they're working on two separate companies. The beauty of that is so much of uh, Dojo Mojo's product development is informed by the needs that WellPath continues to have because WellPath is patient zero for Dojo Mojo and continues to be you know, several years on now. Um, so the you know, people who run product over at Dojo Mojo will walk over to someone on the WellPath team and kind of be getting that immediate real-time feedback. Yeah, so yeah, but it's interesting in the sense that, um, yeah, you started with do, like a, you know, a direct-to-consumer brand, but then also out of the same time, um, because of your inherent pains, you've spun out a SaaS product and you've kind of turned kind of like a, a cost center into a profit center in, in some way, shape or form. Um, and yeah, it's not a traditional path, but very, very smart. Um, and I praise you for that. So you said you're launching more brands. Uh, why is that? That is a common thing I see amongst e-commerce founders. They don't just stick with one brand. They tend to want to launch more. Why? Sure. Uh, so the, the kind of next stage of our journey was we had this thesis that uh, the strategy we use to really capital efficiently build WellPath using Dojo Mojo as well as some of our other internal know-how uh, and the team was one that we could do across a handful of brands. Um, and part of that was also informed by, we thought that there was a lot of niches that people haven't really touched because they go ignored by the venture community, particularly on the consumer side, where you look at categories and you say, all right, you know, maybe that's a $200 million market. And every venture capitalist will say, if 200 million is the total market, and you were to take 25% market share, you build a $50 million business, that's not interesting for venture investment, right? Um, and we heard that refrain often. So we'd look around within um, the broader kind of health and wellness universe, and we'd say like, there's definitely those pockets and, and there's pocket, those pockets are getting, if not outright neglected, they're getting neglected by the better entrepreneurs because the better entrepreneurs are wanting to go after bigger um, you know, go after the whales, so to speak. So we said, well, we can, uh, from a single holding company, actually go out and build these businesses that maybe the, the ultimate outcome for them is they only get to 25 million or 30 million or 40 million of top line, but they can have a super devout customer base. They can be great profitable businesses with exit opportunities to larger strategics. And if we do it several times over, where you know we go build four or five businesses like this it can still be in aggregate a large economic outcome um, and what we've been able to do we launched the second brand uh, on september 9th we're launching the third brand on the cpg side on uh, in mid-january uh, and we've been able to take the same team by and large um, you know the same engineering infrastructure to take all the audiences we've already developed with WellPath and use them to kind of function as a springboard for Finn, which is the, the pet brand that we just launched, 
uh, with the plan that we're going to continue doing that. And so now Finn has a 200,000 person email list of its own. Wellpath promotes Finn products. Finn promotes Wellpath products. And ultimately, we're building an ecosystem where each brand will have its own uh, content and community and uh, both the email audiences as well as you know across all the other traditional channels. And each one will be able to support the next in this virtuous cycle. I'm curious. You said that uh, you know this pet brand Finn. Um, you're able to promote to Wellpath audience and vice versa. Uh, that doesn't seem just like top level. Like there would be much uh, congruency there. Sure. I, I think what so and and I can't take ownership of this. My my business partner often talks about. Uh, thinking about audiences a little bit like how we think about so many other underutilized assets in this modern day, right? So, you know, Airbnb, one of the principles of it was you have an underutilized asset in the form of your apartment when you're not there that you could rent out. The Uber was the underutilized asset is, you know, the tons of cars that are sitting in parking garages the majority of the day. Um, we started to think about audiences as underutilized assets, particularly for commerce brands. Uh, if you're well path and you have 10 products. At some point, even if someone loves reading your content, they might have made the determination that, hey, none of, none of this guy's 10 products are for me. And so telling them about it for the hundredth time doesn't do us much good, right? But we could be promoting, that person might be a pet owner, for instance, and might be interested in pet wellness. Um, and so if we promote some of Finn's products, there's actually it's certainly they're not going to be as engaged on well as with Wellpath products if they're a Wellpath reader, but there is a decent chance there's a lot of pet owners out there, right? Um, that they might engage with that, and so it enables us to use these email lists that we have and utilize them better as opposed to just kind of you know shouting into a void and promoting the same ten products over and over and over again. And the same goes for Finn, in our opinion. You know, if someone's buying and reading about pet wellness and products that can support their pet's health, there's a reasonable likelihood or at least a potential that they would care about buying products that support their own health. Um, so the through line about uh, all the brands that we're building is they're all going to be touching wellness, which we think creates a narrative consistency and theme across all of them and the opportunity to cross sell, um, which to your point, isn't perfect, right? I think the Finn audience and the Wellpath audience is different. They're different brands. They have um, you know different ways that we write the content, a, a myriad of things. Um, but nonetheless, there's enough overlap that it's proven reasonably effective thus far. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, launching a pet brand into recession, Smart Play. It's one of the one of the industries that is uh, often not affected during these times. Um, I'm curious as well, uh, what is the next brand that you're working on launching? Sure. Um, I can't give too much away as it relates to it because it's in somewhat stealth. Um, but we are basically going to be taking um, certain ancient superfoods that have never been put into a delivery mechanism that um, we're working on to, you know, a delivery mechanism that I would coin as uh, much more enjoyable than either putting a powder in your smoothie or taking a pill um, and taking these ancient superfoods that for specific reasons largely related to they taste really, really bad. Um, no one's ever figured out how to put them in you know, tasty delivery mechanisms. Uh, so that's what we're launching in January with uh, we'll, we'll come out the gate with four, four SKUs. This uh, sounds like um, this is a very scalable play because you've got the blueprint. You use the email, um, your email strategy. You can still, you've got internal know-how probably most likely across influencers, influencer marketing and, uh, you know, PPC using various paid channels. You've got your metrics. Um, so you've got the recipe to scale this out across multiple brands and then have a whole overall like holding company. Um, so... How do you manage around simplicity versus complication? Because oftentimes these strategies sound sexy and uh, they could work very, very well, but the operational cost across, you know, having so many different brands uh, 
can be quite um, stressful or, you know, it, it's tough. Like, what, what's your take there? I saw you laugh or smile. Yeah, so you, no, yeah. I, I, I think you're 100% right, right? And I'd, I'd be um, being dishonest with you if I said we'd completely figured that one out yet. Um, I think it takes a certain special kind of hubris to suggest that, you know, you're trying to build multiple brands at once and that the complexity of doing that will never become a challenge. Um, it's a thing that the, myself and the rest of the leadership team have wrestled with a fair bit when it comes to, you know, even some quote unquote simple things like, well, what roles would live at the operating company levels and what roles would live at the platform level, right? So an easy one for us to make a decision on was, well, engineering will live at the plat each uh, at the platform because you know most CPG companies have the way their engineering needs tend to work is you need a lot of engineering if you're going to go do a new site build or something like that for a short amount of time. But then most of the time you don't need that much in the way of engineering resources, right? You're doing conversion rate optimization and that sort of stuff, but you don't need a full time engineering team in a meaningful way. Um, but then there's a lot of uh, roles even like design, for instance, where, well, maybe early on a brand doesn't need a full-time designer, but pretty quickly you want to have a designer who owns the brand voice entirely. Um, and so the way we've architected it out, and this is in flux, and I think will be in flux until you know we have a brand that gets to 40 million and um, have a bunch of different irons in the fire. But the way we've architected it out so far is our goal is by a brand, by the time a brand gets to about 20 million, it should have largely a dedicated team of its own. Um, because at that point, it's, it's, a, it's a real company, right? And, the, and WellPath's getting to that point right now. Um, and the, what we are working on now is trying to figure out what the timeline will generally look for when certain roles go in-house at the brand level and away from the platform level. And I think that's the tricky thing to find out of making sure that you're doing it um, soon enough that the brand benefits from having a full-time resource in whatever role that is, but not so soon that you know the brand's P&L is completely out of whack. Um, and I think uh, I think we've got some learning to do on that. We're still, you know, what I'd call in the second inning of our journey on uh, building the holding company. Yeah, got you. I appreciate your honesty, man. Yeah, look, I think. Um... Yeah, look, it, it it will be a challenge, and like you know, it's it it's fun though that idea of like you know having many different brands, and effectively you're building like your own internal agency, and then that agency serves the different clients, which you, yeah, but you but you control it all. Um, Okay, awesome. Well, look, uh, we have to work towards wrapping up, Colin. I'm mindful of your time; it's getting late where you are. Um, Two last questions. Uh, question number one was just around kind of any final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to share, uh, anything uh, I didn't ask you that you would have liked me to ask you. And then uh, second is where's the best place people can find out more about, um, yeah, your, your various brands? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll answer them in somewhat rever reverse order. Uh, Innovation Department is our holding company's website. It's innovationdept.com. That's where um, we kind of have the latest news about uh, the, the, the entirety of the portfolio um, and where you know, things like job postings, et cetera, we are, I should note, we are actively hiring. Um, we're really proud that we get to say that in the midst of COVID. Um, and, you know, as it relates to kind of words of wisdom, I think, there's such a wide audience for people who are uh, listening to this podcast. Uh, I think when it comes to early stage people, and I'd heard it said, but I never fully internalized it. I mean, it is not a straight path. We spent the first two years, um, what I felt like an abject failure. And um, we have times where it feels like we're getting you know, kicked in the butt. And then times where things are going really well. The best advice my dad ever gave me, which is the same advice that I tell everyone on our team, is this too shall pass. But I don't normally say it when things are going really badly. I actually try to remind people that when things, everything seems to be going our way. Um, because you know the good times will end just as surely as the bad times. So things do tend to even out, particularly when you just kind of continue 
working at it and, and persistence goes such a long way in this game. Um, you know, picking up the phone and making that extra call is served me so well that, uh, you know, I often have thought that the people who end up succeeding over the long term are just simply the people who are able to stay in the game the longest and keep at it. Um, and that's certainly been the case with us. Love it, man. Well, look, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, hope you're loving our videos and that you're getting heaps of value from them. If you are, make sure to hit the like button and make sure to subscribe to join the Founder Fam. And if there's any burning questions you have, make sure to leave them below in the comments. If you did enjoy this video and want to continue to master your skills, make sure you click here to access your free training now, where we'll go into way more depth with this founder. See you there.